Hello and welcome to my music room in sunny Los Angeles. Today, one of my passions, great sounding film music on vinyl. I already did a video about the uh, great sounding compilations of different film music and you can look that up on my channel. Today I'm going to focus on 10 soundtracks uh, which are fantastic sounding and also very interesting musically. Um, and we've got a wide range of stuff here, so let's get right into it. Number one, maybe not a surprise, John Williams, our greatest living film composer without a doubt. And this is not the original score to The Empire Strikes Back, but this is a re-recording of excerpts from it done by Charles Gerhardt of the National Philharmonic Orchestra the group that was responsible for the wonderful series of RCA classic film scores. Um, I would say this is the best score of all the Star Wars movies that John Williams has written. Um, and the reason I'm selecting this, it may be an early digital recording, but it's a really good digital recording. And I just love the sound of this, the performances on this. You get um, a great, uh, notes and photographs. There we go. Um, I believe this has just been reissued, so it shouldn't be hard to find. Uh, all of these, except for one or two, uh, I focused on records which you should be able to find and not pay too much money, except for one at the end, but which I just had to include. We'll come to that later. Anyway, Empire Strikes Back, uh, fantastic record. Moving on to something very different, um, electronic music. And this is the soundtrack to A Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick's extraordinary film. Now, this is a really fantastic score, and it's one of the things that absolutely makes the movie. Um, the music was written and um, recorded by Walter Carlos, now known as Wendy Carlos, who was an, a pioneer of electronic music. And he had had a, a great hit with his record Switched on Bach, in which he had taken music by Bach and arranged it for the Moog synthesizer. It was a huge bestseller. Anyway, around the sort of before Clockwork Orange, well, I guess it was still in production, independently he was working on a way to create synthesized voices and um, he had done a, a, a sort of demo of that doing the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, the final movement, and he created this really extraordinary effect where you heard a synthesized voice and at the same time, he thought, oh, I need to put that into context. So he started working on uh, an electronic piece called Time Pieces, which was really his, completely his own composition. Now, around this time, a friend of his had told him about Kubrick's movie. Actually, first of all, it told him about the book by Anthony Burgess, which Carlos loved, and I think partly inspired uh, the music he was making at this point purely speculative. Um, and then he heard from the same friend about the movie Kubrick was doing. And so what he did was he put together a, a demo tape of his longer piece called Time Pieces and his little section where he had synthesized voices for the finale of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Kubrick loved it and hired him. And the result was this extraordinary score in which Carlos did his synthesized versions of classical music. You've got the Beethoven, which is a key because it's the favorite, he's the favorite composer of the main character played by Malcolm McDowell. But you've also got little bits of Rossini, uh, etc., etc. It's, a, a, I think it's from Purcell, is it, for the opening? Yes. Purcell's music for the funeral of Queen Mary, that very striking opening where you have that close-up shot on Malcolm McDowell and his droogs on his eye 
and the camera just slowly pulls back and you have that fantastic synthesized version of Purcell. Anyway, um, the record sounds pretty damn good. Uh, it's also been issued in an expanded uh, form on CDs. You can find that. But to be honest, that sounds better. Um, but there's, there's always magic in vinyl. Uh, even though CBS Records are somewhat notorious for not sounding the best, not having the quietest surfaces, but still, and look at this fantastic artwork. Uh, just wonderful. This is a great record, highly recommended, and I highly recommend investigating all the Walter Carlos uh, records. Um, I have a whole bunch of them. I'll be talking about them in a separate video. Moving on, a film which at the time um, was not, it didn't make a big splash. It is now generally regarded as something of a classic, and that is Rumblefish. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola's movie that he made in the 80s. Very stylized. Uh, it was a follow-up to The Outsiders based on also one of a book by S.E. Hinton. Uh, shot in black and white. Very stylized. A very intricate sound design done by the great Richard Beggs. One of the great movie sound designers. Uh, he had started out on Apocalypse Now. Has gone on to make uh, do sound design for all kinds of incredible films um, but Coppola took the really brilliant step of hiring Stuart Copeland the drummer from The Police to write the score for this film and there was very close collaboration between uh, Copeland and the sound designer Richard Beggs to create a, 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 a seamless soundtrack which was very much exploring the psychology of the characters through sound and music. Um, I cannot recommend the film too highly. I think it's one of Coppola's very best films. It's right up there for me with The Godfather 1 and 2 and Apocalypse Now. This is a fantastic film. But this record is tremendous. The sound on it is tremendous. The score is very dynamic very unusual and it also has a wonderful uh, title song in which Copeland uh, collaborated with um, Stan Ridgway from Wall of Voodoo and they did this incredibly evocative unusual song called Don't Box Me In. This record sounds fantastic, it's just a regular old uh, American pressing it, it sounds great. Cannot recommend this highly enough. And you can totally listen to the record away from the film. Going back a little bit, um, the wonderful Henry Mancini. Now, of course, everyone knows the Pink Panther movies, the film scores uh, like Peter Gunn, etc. Now, these have been reissued both by Speaker's Corner and now by Analog Productions. Uh, those are great scores, undoubtedly. But the one I picked is this one, Hatari. This is the Analog Productions reissue, it's at 33. This, uh, you'll be familiar with one particular song from this, uh, The Baby Elephant Walk, which is just one of the most charming scenes in the film and is an absolutely, absolutely delightful uh, piece of music. But, the whole score is tremendous. It really evokes uh, a feeling of being in Africa. You know, um, the film was shot on location and it was done for real. When, when they're chasing these rhinoceri, rhinoceri pardon me, um, etc., it's all done for real. They had real safari guys and the cameras are really there and no CGI. Uh, and when the, that rhinoceros comes at the jeep and Boy, it's, it's for real. But this is an absolutely wonderful score, and this reissue sounds tremendous. Uh, cannot recommend it too highly, especially if you already love Mancini and want to explore things other than, you know, Peter Gunn, Pink Panther, Chirag, which is also great. Now, 
a complete change of pace. One of the most interesting films, one of the most striking film scores of the last, uh, I would say even 20 years, um, this is a film called Under the Skin. It's, it kind of picks up on some of the ideas in the classic old film, uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth, the idea of an alien living amongst us, except this alien, played by Scarlett Johansson, uh, basically eats people in this rather surreal and very disturbing manner. Uh, this is a fantastic film made by a Scottish director, and this score is really adventurous. It's done by a, a British composer called Mika Levy. I'm not entirely sure that's how you pronounce her name, but that's my best shot. And uh, she has written a really extraordinary score here. It, it completely captures the otherworldly aspects of the story, and this is a wonderful listen in and of itself. Uh, I cannot recommend it too highly. Under the Skin, Mika Levy. Now we're going to do a complete about turn and go back in time to one of my favorite film composers. And I actually would say probably my favorite film composer, Bernard Herrmann. Um, now Herrmann is, he began his career oh, what film? Citizen Kane, working with Orson Welles, pretty good place to start. He then had a legendary uh, collaboration with Hitchcock. Um, but there was this whole other side of his career where he wrote for these fantasy films uh, by the great Ray Harryhausen, stop motion animation. One of the best of these is The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. I knew this score from extracts that had been recorded by Herman himself on the fantasy film world of Bernard Herman. Um, but a friend, knowing my interest many years ago, gave me this record. And this is um, the actually the original motion picture soundtrack. Uh, I think the film was shot in around 57, 58. Don't quote me on that, it's around that time. And I had no special expectations for this record. In fact, I didn't play it for years. I wasn't, back then, I wasn't really listening to records. I was mainly listening to CDs. And then I finally opened this up, cleaned it, and it's on the, the Res uh, Saraband label. If you can see, there's the back. Um, I put this on could not believe my ears. This is the original stereo soundtrack, and I'm assuming they took this from the original stereo stems, that's what they call the, the part of the mix that, you know, for that particular, for the music, they call it the stems. I'm assuming they took it from this. Um, the sound on this record is absolutely unbelievable, and Herman's specialty in all his music was very exotic, interesting orchestration. He always tailored the sound of his scores to the movie itself. There would be some kind of correlation between the sound world that he was creating and the world of the visual world of the film. So on all these Ray Harryhausen movies, uh, he really went to town with exotic orchestrations. And this is no exception. I mean, one of the most famous examples in it is uh, when he has to score the section where Sinbad fights with a life-size dinosaur. And um, Herman orchestrates it for all kinds of wooden percussion and for xylophone. And it just sounds terrific. But the recording quality on this record is stunning. And you can find this, I see this in used stores for just a few dollars. And it's a tremendous recording. Um, many uh, early stereo sound, uh, early stereo film scores from the late 50s, early 60s, they were beautifully recorded. And so these records sound tremendous. I mean, 
in the world of classical music, you've got uh, Mercury, for example, and Everest. They actually use 35 millimeter film stock to record their records. Um, so if you find this, grab it. Tremendous musically and uh, tremendously exciting in an, for an audiophile. Can't recommend this highly enough. Staying with Bernard Herrmann, his final score, uh, Taxi Driver. Um, he wrote this, it, basically what happened with Herman after he had the huge blow up with Hitchcock, um, he was a little bit in the wilderness uh, in film scoring because it, the industry was going through a period of uh, using a lot of popular song, that kind of scoring, which was not his thing. That was how he had for falling out with Hitchcock over Torn Curtain. Hitchcock had wanted him to write a more uh, commercial score, you know, maybe with a, a good song on the title to sell the the soundtrack. And Herman didn't do that. And they had a bust up at the recording session and Herman walked out and that was the end of that. So for a number of years, he wasn't getting as much scoring work in Hollywood. He tended to score uh, foreign films, started to do independent films. I mean, he worked with Francois Truffaut, wonderful couple of scores for Bright Ball Black, Fahrenheit 451. Um, but with the new generation of, uh, of directors, people like Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma, who knew their film history and greatly admired Herman, they started to use him for their scores. Um, Brian De Palma used him for Obsession, which was a, a reworking of Vertigo. And Scorsese chose Herman to do Taxi Driver. And famously, the night that they finished mixing the soundtrack, i.e. they recorded the score and they mixed it. Uh, Herman went home and he died in his sleep that night. So this was his last score. This score, I, I don't need to tell any of you who've, who've seen the film. I mean, it makes the film. It is so dark, uh, uses sort of a brooding saxophone solo over these thick wind chords and, and harps. It, it's a tremendous score. It's available in a number of formats, um, a number of issues on vinyl. This is an issue that was done a few years ago. I think it's on uh, Death Waltz record, well, wax, Waxwork, there we go, with this original artwork. Um, you've got this fantastic piece of artwork on the center spread, which is from the end of the film after the massacre where the the camera is up in the ceiling looking down and just pans through the destruction. Um, you've got uh, a great insert here, if I, can, if I can get it out, with um, Martin Scorsese writing about the film and what it means to him and working with Herman. We've got some nice artwork there and a whole section here. This is a beautiful reissue. It's on two LPs. Uh, it's got some extra material in it which is really interesting. Um, I won't go into all the details of that but highly highly recommended. Changing Gear. Um, again this is a film which was really outstanding another Scorsese movie that he did a few years later, a passion project of his that he tried to get made for years. And again, this is a case where the director hired not an obvious composer, um, but in doing so created a really extraordinary sound world for his film. That film is The Last Temp Temptation of Christ. And the composer was the British rock star Peter Gabriel and Scorsese knew that Gabriel had really explored a lot of world music in his albums and that was the sound world that Scorsese wanted. He, he made the film um, making it very real. It was the completely complete opposite of 
what you would expect in a Hollywood movie about biblical themes, stories, Christ, whatever. This was a completely different approach. And so Gabriel based his score around music of, uh, of Africa, etc. Uh, so the score has this really solid foundation in, the kind, in ethnic music of the region. Um, and it is just fantastic. Uh, I cannot recommend it highly enough and it's a great listen on its own. What he did was for the album, he kind of, he blended together cues, etc., to make it a proper, uh, complete listening experience on its own. Now, this is the old classic records reissue on 200 gram vinyl. Uh, this is absolutely the best version of it. You've got these nice, uh, notes and pictures of the sessions on the inside uh, beautiful design um, all these peter gabriel reissues on classic records are tremendous sounding subsequently peter gabriel has reissued these on himself um, i've not actually heard any of these reissues some of them are on 45 um, they've had mixed reviews uh, I, I can't really tell you which is going to sound, whether it sounds that much worse. But in general, I would always stick with classic records. Uh, they always did tremendous pressings, or, or anything they touched. Highly, highly recommended. Passion. Uh, going back to John Williams. This is one, um, it's an undoubtedly great score. Um, but this particular edition of it, you might have to pay a little bit more money for, but it's worth it. Raiders of the Lost Ark. And this was issued on DCC Compact Classics. DCC Compact Classics was a, a label um, which kept going through the 90s, I think, and maybe into the noughts a little bit. Uh, put together by Steve Hoffman and Kevin Gray. And if this was one of the early labels that did really great audiophile reissues. They went back to the master tape, they did it all analog, often with tube mastering gear, and um, they, they did a whole bunch of great records, all of which you can find, but you may have to pay a bit more for. This is a tremendous edition. You've got a beautiful uh, spread on the inside, photos telling the story of, of writing the music, etc. And there's really nothing more I can say about the film uh, and the score I wouldn't say it's great. Um, this is wonderful. You'll love it. If you're a John Williams fan, this is an absolute must buy. Now, one of my passions in film music uh, is the whole genre of spy films, detective films, TV shows from the 60s and 70s, obviously James Bond, etc. Um, and what this is a really unusual project. Uh, the film itself, I would not recommend. Um, this is the big screen version of The Man from Uncle. What makes this phenomenal is the score by Daniel Pemberton. He basically went back to the whole style of what of how spy movies, etc., were scored in the 60s and he dug out the instruments he went to abbey road and found the original kind of microphones recording gear um, and found many musicians some of the musicians that actually worked on some of these kinds of movies and he put together a killer score it's the best thing about the movie the movie's kind of a mess guy ritchie oh god yeah less said about that the better but this score is fantastic this is available on um this is a reissue done on the uh, music on vinyl label at the movies it is definitely sourced from digital um but it sounds great and if you're a lover of that old sound the john barry sound lalo schifrin mission impossible Jerry Goldsmith, our man Flint. If you're a fan of that kind of thing, you're gonna love this. It's also beautifully sequenced. Uh, 
they use some source music uh, songs and um, they get lots of photos of the sessions and somewhere in here again yeah there's a great insert book which has more photos and talking about how the score was uh, put together uh, I believe this is still available you shouldn't have to pay too much for it if you can't find it I mean you can always just spring for it on cassette the, the film um, on CD the film kind of disappeared I mean it was a bit of a dud of a boat box office um, but the score is sensational so I thought I'd finish up with my friend over here one of the great film schools of all time and this is a beautiful deluxe edition and that film is Alien here we have a beautiful deluxe version of this put out by Mondo Mondo specializes in doing reissues of uh, film scores but with their own original art unfortunately in the last year or so year two years they've been putting out less material probably partly because of a pandemic um, but I've got a whole slew of these and they're terrific even though they're cut I believe mostly from digital but they're done really really well and I will do a video on Mondo releases in the future but I did just want to show this to you I, I haven't even gone online to see how much it would cost to get this um, it will probably cost quite a bit but if you want it this is the way to go so you'll see here there's the outer box with this wonderful artwork there we go and then you've got four separate records now the reason we're for records is because uh, Alien has a complicated story in terms of the soundtrack. Jerry Goldsmith wrote the music but then Ridley Scott replaced some of his music with alternate cues. Uh, this is something that happens quite often. Jerry Goldsmith was not too happy. But a few years back they put out on CD first the complete original score that is including all the cues that Jerry Goldsmith wrote uh, in addition to um, the original soundtrack album which I, I wouldn't bother trying to buy um, the sound the pressings are not good it's a record I've had for years but it never sounded that great and then also included on that CD two CD set were extra cues which Goldsmith had used and just extra stuff so when they came to do this special edition Mondo put it out in two forms they put it out in a regular uh, I believe it's two disc set with different artwork and then they did this deluxe version and as you can see this artwork is just tremendous I mean, you've got tracks on the back that's disc one disc two face hugger in all its glory Ah, the chest burster. There we go. I remember I went to see Alien the day it opened, and of course, no one knew what was coming. And I was sitting in the movie theater, I went to a tea time screening. I will never forget that moment at the dinner table where the, the, the alien comes out of John Hurt's chest. Um, the whole cinema, everyone levitated at the same moment. It was extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. Um, there we go and then finally a full-grown beastie wonderful stuff you also get a couple of these sort of inserts um, there's this which has uh, notes about the record there you go and this extra piece of artwork that, would go right. that is from the vantage point of um, uh, poor old uh, John Hurt as the uh, chest burster is coming out of it there we go as the chest burster is coming out of his chest and then you've got that on the back um, 
it it is a beautiful addition. Um, it will cost you money, but if you're a fan of Alien, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, or you can also spring for just the, the 2LP version, which, which will also be great if you don't need all the extra stuff. Um, well, there we are. There's 10 records of particular film soundtracks. I highly recommend both musically and in terms of the sonics, plus the extra one of the bonus of Alien. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, do please uh, give me a like if you like this. Subscribe, would love to have you subscribe as I'm going to be doing more videos about film music, classical music uh, and beyond. Uh, many thanks for watching. Bye.